All right, quick reminder that hunt stock tickets are available online and also in person at Reedy's Archery in Middleborough, and you'll be able to get them from me also at the Springfield Sportsman Show in February. I'll have a booth next to the Northeast Big Buck Club. On this week's Hunt Suburbia podcast, I sit down with John Moulton. He is a, a tremendous sportsman and outdoorsman, woodsman, hunter from New Hampshire. He um, He's really dedicated to the woods and um, deer and moose, and he loves shed hunting. He's got over a 1,000 sheds um, from New Hampshire alone, which is pretty incredible, uh, between whitetails and, um, and moose. Um, he's a tremendously good hunter. He's killed uh, a lot of whitetail, uh, a lot of 200-pounders, including two this year um, that both had great stories. So we talk about those stories. We talk about what it's like up in New Hampshire in the big woods um, and get into a little bit of everything. But uh, here it is, Hunt Suburbia podcast with John Moulton. All right, so another episode of Hunt Suburbia, and I'm sitting here with John Moulton from uh, northern New Hampshire, right? Central. Central? Yep. Yeah, north of here. North of here. A <laughs> couple hours. Uh, John, uh, thanks for coming down. And um, John was just telling me as he pulled in, a little bit different down here, a little faster than you're used to. Yeah, huh? yeah, definitely a little bit more traffic than I'm used to. And you hadn't been south of New Hampshire, I mean, in Manchester in, what, four years or something? Yeah, I think I'd been down to my daughter's in Connecticut once, but yeah. via 91, but not not down through Massachusetts. Yeah, I, so. well, I, I, uh, I'm jealous of you being up there in the big woods and... It's it's nice. I love where I live. It's it's just a lot of advantages for sure. Yeah, as you can see, John's uh, got some real big antlers on the table here. A lot uh, a lot of sheds. He's got a show and tell uh, the buck he killed this year that we'll bring up a little bit later. Um, but you are you're huge into shed hunting, right? Yeah, I it's something I picked up at an early age. Um, started out hunting with my dad, of course, and getting me out there and I remember I know I was probably 11 12 years old I found a shed and I just was amazed by it and uh ever since I I'd say I'm kind of obsessed with antlers yeah and then it's like once I found one I wanted to see how I could find others you know and it just it just kind of snowballed from there and uh it's something I've been doing for I don't know 35 almost 40 years so snowballed into a thousand antler collection right thousand plus all from new hampshire all from new hampshire yeah. yeah i i found some in maine i've looked a little bit in the last few years and stuff but most all of it's from central new hampshire where i live yeah and a lot of moose and a lot of whitetail like what's uh you know are you out you are you out particular when you go out you're looking for just moose and and if you stumble upon a whitetail it's it's bonus or the other way around or? um usually usually at different areas so <laughs> If you're looking for deer, antlers, that's where you're at. And once in a while, you know, you would find both, but it's usually one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've also been a scorer for, um, what is the name of the Yep, the for, the, for our New Hampshire Antler Skull and Trophy Club yep. uh, since, uh, I guess, the mid-90s. So about 25 years now, been scoring yep. antlers. Scored a lot of bucks. Scoring a lot of bucks, learned a lot, met some good people, um, and it's just uh, it's a good way to get your hands on more antlers yeah, and, yeah. And, and hear stories and and uh, yeah. find out about all the big bucks taken. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was just talking with Brett Joy a few days ago, and I was like, yeah, John Moulton's coming down. Do you know who he is? He's like, oh, yeah, he's uh, also a scorer. He said he hadn't talked to you in a, or yeah. seen you in a couple of years. but yeah. Yeah, since COVID, you know, we used to have the shows and the get-togethers and stuff, and now it's been a couple of years without any of that because that's when, you know, as scorers, we'd get together and you'd see guys that you hadn't seen and talk hunting and and uh, compare notes and stuff, but there hasn't been a much of that. So yep. this year, hopefully, we're back rolling again. Yeah, Essex got canceled, the Essex show. Um, I mean, that was in, supposed to be coming up, like, next week. Yeah. In Vermont, yeah. Um, but the Springfield Sportsman Show is still going on. I don't know if you're planning on going down to that. Well, no, you're not because it's south of yeah, that's, south of Manchester. That's, that's my rule. I'll go north. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, I usually go to the, like the main 
has the show up there, and I've I've been to that a few times up at the Civic Center. Yep. Um, but yeah, well, I uh, like you said, just any way to get your hands on more antler, you know, for you scoring. I was just at Reedy's Archery um, down here. It's a big uh, big archery shop in Middleborough, Mass, and they're a check station too. Uh-huh. And I always thought, you know. It would be fun to work a check station. I mean, you're gonna lose you're gonna lose some some hunting time. Yeah. But just posting up there to see all the deer coming in and um, you know hear all the stories. I yeah. might might do a podcast, do some video at a check station next year. You know. It's funny you say that because uh, growing up as a kid, my dad owned a gas station. and We were a check station. Yeah. Yeah, in Bristol, New Hampshire, and so I got to see back then they brought the bears in too, and so I'd see all the deer and bear, and it was just. You know, as a kid, that just gets you into it that much I was more. I going to say, did that probably fuel the fire oh, a little bit? absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's talk about your dad. And, and um, um, your dad got you into hunting? Did he teach you yep. everything? And... Well, he, he got me into hunting at a, at a young age, took me out, um, and I loved it. It's just something that it always clicked. Uh, but we didn't hunt much after my high school years. Yep. But uh, at that point, I was I was already hooked so much that I was just going all my spare time. Um, but uh, I'll say my parents did let me, you know, skip school occasionally and go on a hunting trip. Uh, I went to Pennsylvania when I was 16 for a week. And then, actually, we did that every year for like 15 years in a row huh. after that. Yeah. And uh, it was just uh, it was just another way to get into it more, you know. Yeah. Did you have a deer camp? or uh, we, we went to a friend's camp once in a while. There was a few years, um, but no really per se camp. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, my dad was a, he was a meat hunter. You know, it was like, yeah. oh, if you're going to get a deer, you, you, you shoot the first one that comes along. So that's the way I started out. What yeah. town were you in? Uh, I grew up in Bristol, Alexandria, uh, and then we moved to Campton when I was like 15. Yeah. Yeah. Um, c- right in central New Hampshire, Grafton County. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you're, when, did you, when did you get your first deer? How old were you? I was 15. 15? Yeah. What was that story? You, you got to still remember it. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's vivid. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, my dad had tracked a buck the week before. And it took him up through some ridges, and um, it crossed this old uh, logging road in this one spot, and there was quite a few tracks crossing right there. And the next weekend, uh, he says, I'm going to take you up there and set you, uh, and uh, I want you to sit there until I come back. He said, I'm going to make a big loop. It's going to take me a couple hours. And, you know, as a kid, uh, it was the last week of deer season if i remember right end of november and it was cold you know when a kid sitting there i was froze to death <laughs> after the first hour you know you know fidgety and moving and stuff and and i'll never forget and i i heard something and, and i looked and here comes this doe flying up um this gut and like a draw and uh there was a buck right behind it and i was just it took me by surprise. I wasn't expecting to see a deer. And uh, within a few seconds, they were through some thick stuff. And I heard something again. Here comes another buck loping. Hmm. By then, I had the 30-30, my old Winchester up. Uh, I fired. I don't even remember aiming, but I know I fired. <laughs> yeah. And the thing just dropped. Oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, with the 30 30 too that's yeah, great yeah. yeah shot it shot it and spined it in the neck and uh, i had to go up and finish it off but it was a it was a 20 inch spread eight pointer 205 pounds wow so for I the first year that for gets the first you. year so i kind of i kind of lucked out that way <laughs> that kind of gets you hooked a little bit too uh getting a nice one uh, my that. dad uh he, he couldn't believe it when he come up through he says your first deer and it's better than anything i ever got yeah you know but yep. i'll never forget it so well you've done well since then too yeah yeah i've cut some nice deer you know it's it's there was years that it didn't have much time to hunt and you would take the first thing that come along and there was quite a few years i really put some effort into it and then when you're 
got a family and kids and stuff, um, you know, you can't take two or three weeks. So, um, but yeah, there was the nineties were good to me. I shot a lot of big deer in the nineties, two thousands, you know, right up through. And then I, the last couple of years, my youngest daughter is uh, 17. So my wife and I are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel as far as raising kids and a yeah. little bit more time and yeah. afford to go a little bit more. And in this uh, this year here, I just said, I'm, I'm going to take a block of time. I ended up taking three weeks off. Oh, yeah. Nothing Good. but hunt for three weeks straight. Yeah. But uh, that's what it takes. Is a, it's a commitment, you know, especially up there in big pieces of woods and stuff. You know, there's not deer everywhere. Yeah. So. I think, you know, time is the most essential thing, and that's what allowed me to step up a little bit um, and scout more and even shed hunting. Like, you, like the more miles you're going to cover, right, the more sheds you're going to find. The more yeah. miles you're going to cover while hunting, the um, more deer you're going to see, more right. deer you're going to get. It's just, it, it, it's time. And then you, if you've got skill and you get, that comes with a lot of time in the woods, yep. all that kind of meets up, right? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, uh, like I said, when it's, when you're younger and growing a family and stuff, it, you can't go take in two or three weeks, but now I can. And, uh, I said to myself this year, okay, I'm going to, uh, did some scouting and I'm really going to put some effort in. I'm going to pass those small bucks and, uh, it ended up paying off. Yeah. So you got a beauty and we'll talk, we'll talk about that one, um, in a little bit here, but. Um, I want to talk about a few things. Larry Benoit, you went to his house when you were, what, 13, you uh, said? Yeah, I, I went there a couple of times, actually. See, my dad ended up playing in a band. Uh, he was very musical with Larry's son-in-law. And uh, that was an in to go up there. And I just, I was just in awe of going in there and seeing all those bucks yep. and, and meeting this guy and... Uh, getting Larry's book, you know, autographed and, uh, you know, he was larger than life. You know, this guy is, he's a legend, you know? Um, but I ended up getting a knife, uh, for Christmas the next year after I'd got my buck. Uh, and I still carry it today. Um, 1982, right? It was... uh, 86, oh, I 86. guess. That, yeah. yeah. I, I guess I was 16. The year after I got my first buck, I got that for Christmas. And I don't know how many of that's gutted, but it's been a lot <laughs> between mine and friends and yeah. being with people. Yeah. Uh, I think when we were uh, we were messaging, um, you said it's over 100 you know, deer that that thing's gutted probably. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, what do you remember about specifically about Larry's house? Anything that stood out to you or about the interaction with them? And no, I was pretty young, and you know, you're a kid. You know, I wish I could go back now, obviously, and um, just just being in R and after seeing the book and reading the book, and this is the guy and the stories and stuff. It's just you know. Some people looked up to sports athletes and stuff like yeah. this, and yeah. this is the guy I looked up to. Yeah. You know, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to learn how to do that. Um, so it was just, it was a great experience. Yeah. So you had a, I mean, you had all the makings to um, become a really good deer hunter and get that inspiration early, right? Your dad taught you. You got a nice buck when you were 15. The next year, you got. A knife and uh, Larry's yeah. book, yeah, uh, one of, one of Larry's knives, and and that just kind of propelled you into the next. Yeah, yeah, and that was about the time I started bow hunting, and uh, I remember working really hard to buy that first bow, and once I got out there and got a taste of that, it was just more time in the woods, and there was a lot of mistakes and trial and error for quite a few years there. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, going to Pennsylvania when I was real young was great because we didn't have a lot of deer and there was a lot of deer there so you could try things and learn things that normally you wouldn't get to yeah um so i think that actually helped the learning curve quite a bit yeah you know where'd you get your first bow deer was it in pennsylvania it was in pennsylvania yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i didn't get one here for 
I don't know, I want to say it was three or four years in, in New Hampshire, but I, I, I didn't get one the first year in Pennsylvania, but when I went back the second year, I got one the first day. And I was like, okay, this this is it. And back then, you could they had the bonus tag system, and some years we could get a couple. So it was it was just uh, really good meat to bring back, and you know we shot a lot of does and stuff. But you know you're 16, 17, 18 years and old. You're just trying to get a deer. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know I didn't. I didn't pass deer up for a long time. And like you said, it allows you to make some mistakes because down there you got so many more deer, you got many many more opportunities to shoot them. And if we're being honest, you probably, you know, a New Hampshire deer because they come so few and far between, and your opportunities are less. You know, a mistake up here in New Hampshire feels a lot worse to you, right? Definitely. So you're willing to make those mistakes down there. Right? Definitely. That yeah. first year. I remember going with a dozen new arrows and not having any arrows left. Yeah. And, yeah. and and you know, it was it was the it was just the whole learning curve and how to draw your bow when they're not looking and I remember shaking like a leaf and <laughs> and uh, you know that that bare white tail too back then, you know, probably thirty yards was pushing it. You probably wanted to shoot, you know, underneath that, but was it a compound or? Yeah, it was yeah. compound. Yeah. Bear white tail too. Um, I bought it from a, a fella there in Campton. Had a little dealer, a little bow shop at his house, and um, I remember getting the deer the next year with it. And I got a few with it before I went to a Hoyt bow. Yeah. And um, I remember that was like a step up. You know, it was a little bit more money and saved up for that and. Uh, that was got quite a few deer with that and uh but new hampshire was definitely uh tree stand hunting and and learning that uh, was easier after going to pennsylvania for yeah. a few years yeah well i know you love the big woods and you do a lot of hiking in the big woods and you know your favorite patch you think you said fifty thousand acres or something right yeah. something yeah. big yeah, and, uh, and then you got millions in the White Mountains. So when when you're bow hunting, are you bow hunting the big woods? Um, or is I, your, how I, does your strategy change from what you're doing when you're when you're with your gun? Well, I don't bow hunt nearly like I used to because if I'm gonna take my time, if I'm gonna take the two or three weeks, it's usually in prime time in the rut. <clears throat> yeah. Um, occasionally I get out with the bow a little bit around the house. I do hunt some of the big woods late season. It's really good when they're back on the feed. Yeah. Um, this year it just didn't work out. I just had three weeks off. I had to get back to work, and I'm I'm like, ah, there's all kinds of deer sign, and I I just uh, I really couldn't do it. Couldn't take the time. Um, but it's uh, it's definitely hard to bow hunt in the big woods. Yeah. I am not a really good sitter or a stand hunter anymore. Uh, since my back injury, I get if I get cold, I, I get cramped up really tight. That's why I like to hunt with a gun more, do more still hunting, more tracking. Um, it's kind of it's kind of up my alley now. Yeah, well, it keeps the back loose too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just I just can't you know get wet and then get up in a tree after sweating to get in there and stay there all day. That's not me anymore. Um, no, that that's definitely tough. So um, you got a nice buck this year. Let's talk about that guy real quick. Yeah. You wanna you wanna pull up the antlers and do a show and tell? Yeah. Yeah. And you got him. Uh, you were tracking, or how'd you get this? No, one? this was still hunting. Yep. It was. Uh, this was the last day of muzzleloader. Um. It was really really warm. You know, uh, I'd hunted this section of woods in the morning that I'd been hunting for a couple of days. Um, I had seen a buck the day before and I had passed a buck there opening day of muzzleloading. And uh, a friend of mine went in the same piece uh, two or three miles down the road. Huge mountain with a bunch of ridges on it. And uh, that, that morning I just, it was warm. I wasn't seeing the sign. Um, about midday, I checked my phone. I was up high. There's really no coverage up there most, but if you get up high, usually you can 
check your phone or messages and he said that uh he thought they were chasing down on the other end because he'd seen a buck that morning chasing just for a couple of seconds so what, what was the date uh november 9th I oh yeah believe. Uh, yeah i forgot your muzzle order season's early yeah yeah, <clears throat> yeah. it was the last yeah. day because rifle opened on a wednesday this was the tuesday the day before yeah so uh i headed down that way and i'm hiking back up this ridge at like uh 12 31 o'clock and it's hot it's like 57 degrees out yeah you know um but I got up, it's really steep ground, and I, I get up in the first section, and I take a little breather, and uh, there's some thick softwood knobs with mixed conifers, hemlock and pine and stuff, and I said, geez, it's a real hot day, be a good place, it's kind of cool in there, I'm going to check those out. So um, I'm bumping along, and... Uh, I'm going up and down those little knobs and those ridges, and I'm seeing some sign. They'd been through there, but um, like I said, it was really hot, and I, I pitched down off this uh, steep ledge on a on a bench on a shelf. And there's rubs and scrapes, quite a few of them right there, um, and uh, the sweat's coming right. I'm down to. I had my sweatshirt on with a t-shirt underneath, and. Um, I'd, I'd gone light, I dropped my pack and I took just the essentials, my, my spare loads and, and I said, Jesus, a pretty good rub and scrape line right there. I'm going to just sit here for a minute and cool off. And I backed up against this oak tree. I wasn't there for maybe two minutes and I heard something and I'm looking up this flat and you can only see probably 70, 80 yards um it's it's fairly thick this was the more open spot thick all around it and i said that's a deer i can hear the gate or trot of a deer and within a second or two i could see legs first and then he hit the first open and i see rack yeah and it's just i knew it was a shooter the instant <laughs> i saw it yeah um so i uh i picked the muzzleloader up he's coming right at me yeah um when he hit about 45 or 50 yards, he started to walk stiff-legged. I had the wind in my favor, but he sent something. He knew something was up. He knew something was up. And uh, when they get tense in that look, it's now or never. So I, I fired. He was kind of quartering to me. Um, hit him in the shoulder, busted his shoulder, and he went right by me at like, I don't know, 30 or 40 feet. He hmm. went by me. Yeah. And uh, I just sat there for a minute. Uh, he went out of sight, and I grabbed my loads. I reload and stuff. And I said, I'm going to just wait 10 to 15 minutes. And I waited about five. That's yeah, about all I can take. always happens, right? Um, yeah. But I walked over to where he was standing when I shot, and I saw the cut hair. Uh, no blood, which didn't surprise me. With a, with a muzzleloader, sometimes with an angling shot, too, if it doesn't exit, um, I waited a few minutes there, and I said, you know, I'm just going to go check where he went out of sight, which was only 50 yards maybe. Um, I got to that spot, and uh, no blood, but I could see his running track right there. And I didn't take a couple more steps, and he was down over a bank, and he jumped out of his bed. Oh, yeah? And uh, I fired again. And then I went into panic mode, get, going to get another load in. And I, he went out of sight really quick because it's really thick right there. But I he heard bolt, him. Bolt out of bed. Yeah, he, he, now he was kind of slow getting out. I got another yeah. shot. I hit him on the second shot. All right. um, and then when he went out of sight, I reloaded. And uh, I said, geez, he didn't go far that time. He's not going to go far again. I need to end this. And uh, I went down there and... Did you take your time, or did you get it on him fast? Or I got on him pretty fast at that point. Was because it kind I, of quiet walking still? Or? It, was, it wasn't It was bad. Okay. Uh, I'd, yeah. I'd saw him go down this bank, and then I saw him stumble. And, and I knew he was hit hard yeah. here. Yeah. Um, and I got he probably only went another 50, 60 yards, and he was in his bed again. And uh, he was looking back my way. Yeah. And I was able to 
to get to the other side and get the opposite shoulder on the next shot. And uh, that pretty much ended it. Yeah. It seems like when they're looking back like that, you know, yeah. he knows it's over. He's just, you know, come yeah. on, come and do it, you know. Yeah, come yeah I want it I want it done as quick as possible. Oh, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, but at that point, I waited a minute, and I walked up to him. I'm like, boy, he got bigger as I got up to him. I knew it was a good deer, but it's just that instant. Yeah. When you saw him, you know that's a shooter. Yeah. I shot. I try not to to dwell and stare, but I, I knew it was a good one. I got up to him, and he got bigger. Yeah. Um, and you say he's a green score about 140. Gross. Yep. That's a beautiful buck. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in New Hampshire and these northern states. Yeah. The yep. six, 60 days will be up this weekend, so yep. um, I'm going to get Roscoe or Brian Emerson to score it for me, and yep. and we'll know for sure. But Awesome. Um, after I... After I got up to him there, my buddy that was in the same piece of woods, I ended up uh, getting to a spot. I had coverage, and I sent him a message. And uh, it was, um, he didn't get it. There was no reply. And it was about, I don't know, 45 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes. He came up over the bank, and I was some glad to see him because yeah. at that point, I'm like, okay, this is going to be much easier getting this out of yeah. here. How much do you weigh? Uh, he dressed 215. Oh, wow. So oh, beautiful. We we were both looking at it, and I said, geez, I don't know. Is he? He's right around 200, I thought. 195, 200. And my friend John said that he thought he would go 200. And we were surprised. We got him on the scales there a couple hours later. He was 215. Yep. So Sweet. Um, I was happy. Um, how, uh, how many 200-pound deer have you killed, or do you know? Uh, I've... I know I have seven in New Hampshire, and I just took my first main buck uh, three weeks after this. Oh, you did? Was, yeah. Which was a 200-pounder, so uh, I think there's eight. Yeah. Um, well, that's great. Yeah. Uh, shot some more in Canada, but yeah. a lot of those bucks weren't weighed. Yeah. It's not a big weight thing. Yeah. Been to Saskatchewan a few times, and they got some big-bodied deer oh, out yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Needed up there. Yep. Yeah. Um, some of those racks up there actually look smaller than here. Those those big bodies can throw you off. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a few things I want to talk about on the, through your story. You brought up some things um, on this buck here, um, and don't let me forget. I want to talk about you don't use you don't use cameras, so those rubs and scrapes are probably uh, a, a, you know very important um, in your hunting strategy. So I want to talk about that. But you mentioned like on a hot day, you thought he'd be in this thick, sprucey, cooler area. Do you do you notice that a lot? That if it's hot, they go towards water. They go towards some sprucey areas, or you know, and that's where he came out of, right? When you first saw him, yeah, he was he was coming out of some of that dark area, but. The amazing thing is it's 57 degrees, and he was on his feet at 2.30 yeah. in the afternoon. That's what the rut's going to be doing to you. You know? Yep. So the big point that you can take away from this is don't let the conditions discourage you from going hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, a buddy of mine shot one the year before that actually helped me get this out. He shot a beauty 10-pointer. It was 65 degrees out, same scenario, early afternoon um you just gotta hunt you can't say ah oh, it's too hot or it's too cold or it's too wet or um that's the biggest thing is just go all the time and sooner or later law of averages is gonna take all yeah especially in november too right absolutely yeah yeah they were they were definitely chasing that day so let's um, let's talk about your you don't use cameras, which is um, I, you know I think a lot of uh, the older generation is like that still, and like you know guys in their twenties and thirties are super into it. It's just yeah. kind of how you grow up doing it. Um, but you know, there's pros and cons to cameras. Um, you still get it done without using cameras. And so, what is your strategy for well, scouting and uh, and locating these bucks? Well, I I own two cameras. And I love seeing deer pitches. They're great. Um, but, um, you know, I, I've been, I've seen where people can get fooled by them too. Yeah. Uh, if you're always worried about the camera, some of these young guys maybe are, I got to go check that. I want to see what's on it. Um, 
I think that you can the deer can pattern you better than you can pattern them sometimes. Right. Um, I think more so in the big woods too. Yes, in suburbs you get away with it more. Yeah, because um, they're used to seeing deer. They're used to I mean they're used to seeing humans, smelling humans, being around them. So right. going in to check a camera, you right. know, doesn't disturb it like it would in the big woods. Yep. Yeah. No, my as far as scouting goes. Um, I like to go to a few different pieces, you know, the, the week before the season. The week before Muzzleloader started, I went to three different pieces, and I'll spend the whole day. I cover a lot of ground, and I'm looking for rubs and scrape lines. Um, you know, you know from past experience, yep. going in, you, you kind of know where you're looking. You know an area. Yep. You know an area, but... Big bucks live where big bucks live. They, they, they you know, they kind of go to those same general areas. And I checked, uh, I checked one area out that I really thought I was going to hunt, and I, I just wasn't seeing, seeing what I want. So I jumped, uh, I don't know, four or five miles away um, to the spot where I ended up taking this buck, and um, I got right into him. The opening day of muzzleloader, actually, it was pouring rain. It was horrible weather, and uh, I started up in, actually, before I started in, where I was going to park, there was a truck park there, mm-hmm. and I was like, wow, that's, it's rare, up, you know, uh, to see somebody in that spot. I didn't think there'd be anybody there, so I went down the road, uh, I don't know, half, two-thirds of a mile, and I said, I'm going to cut up in the ridge in a different spot, and uh, I started up in with my headlamp on, and I wasn't in there 10 minutes, and I could see another headlamp coming across the ridge. And I'm like, what? <laughs> this, this guy's down here quite a ways from parking up there. And uh, so it threw my whole game plan off. Yeah. But I ended up making a loop and, and coming up on this uh, softwood spine that had some mixed oak and hemlock, and it was just getting daylight. You could You could see. And I said, I'm just going to sit here for a few minutes and let it get good and light. And uh, here comes this guy again. And he walked right in front of me. He didn't see me. He was probably 75 yards away. And he uh, went up and over the spine and uh, right in the direction I planned on going. So I said, well, I'm going to have to go up now. And I went up and I didn't go 100 yards and I could see a deer coming and ended up to being a little uh, basket six point buck. Watched him for, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds. Had the scope on him. And uh, wasn't what I was looking for this year. So uh, let him go. And uh, that was a good move. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah. Uh, I kept hunting on after I saw him. And I was checking an oak spot. And they were they were in the acorns pretty good there. And... It, it rained and the wind was blowing. It was it was tough going that morning. And I made a big swing and up on the hill. And I, I wanted to come down on the steep part and, and uh, check another flat. And I looked down and I could see the, a guy standing there. And I'm like, what are the chances? I never <laughs> bump into anybody. And I've seen this guy three times now. So I, I kind of was going that direction. So I made my way down towards him. And I got within, I don't know, 40, 50 yards of him. He didn't see me. And uh, I saw him turn, and he walked over to a camera on a tree. And I said, oh, okay. So I just waited <laughs> there for a minute, and he popped his SD card, and he, he was scrolling through the pictures. And I walked right up to within about 8 to 10 yards from him. <laughs> and it, but in his defense, it was raining, and yeah. it was the patter of the rain hitting the leaves, and he couldn't hear, so I... I whistled real light, and he picked his head up, and then he went right back to his camera. He didn't see me, uh, or he heard me, but he didn't see me. And finally, he he didn't turn around, so I said, so is there any good bucks on your camera? That must have creeped him out. (laughs) He whipped around, um, and he was really surprised to see me. Um, And I I introduced myself, and... uh, I said, uh, is that your truck parked down below, the white truck? He goes, yeah. He said, that was you with the headlamp on I saw? I said, yeah, yeah, that was me. I said, where are you from? And he said, southern New Hampshire. He said, but originally Idaho, he said. (laughs) 
I said, how the heck did you find this spot? Yeah. He said he just picked it out on a on a Google Earth. Yeah. Which surprised me. And I said, well, this is a pretty good area. Oh, he he's from it. Idaho, and he's he wants those big big parcels, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he did. He, he did his homework, and uh, he picked a good piece of land. And uh, Well, what was he looking for, you think? Saddles? Like, you, when you say big bucks are where big bucks are, in, in the big woods, what have you found that to mean? A lot of... A lot of uh, Terrain differences, uh, a lot of ridges and flats. I like those oak flats where we live. We, you know, we do have acorns, hopefully. Uh, it makes it a lot easier if there is. But just uh, in a ways away from people is, yeah. is the big thing, just so they're not pressured maybe so much. Um, he had some bucks on his camera he was showing me. And actually, uh, one of the bucks on his camera is this buck right here. Oh yeah, and this buck that uh, yep, that uh, I told you about, and uh, that's uh, that one. he had broken off one of his stickers this year and didn't grow one on the other side, but no brow tines on him. But what a huge bodied deer he was. Oh, because he showed you on the camera there. Yeah, he, yeah. Sh he showed me. Yeah, and, it's nice uh, of him. Yeah. So, uh, funny story is uh, I told him, I gave him my information, who I was. I said, yeah. if, you're, if you're hunting up here again and you need help or any questions or anything, I'd be more than willing to help you. And uh, I, I sent him some pictures after I shot that buck. Yeah. And he sent me some pictures. He ended up shooting a buck, not in that piece, but in another one within uh, a couple of miles. And uh, we've texted a few times. So it was it was kind of neat. Cool, uh, yeah. It, it was a good encounter with hunter. I don't usually like to run into hunters, but he was a good guy. And uh, so... Uh, I wonder what he thinks about New Hampshire hunting versus uh, Idaho. Well, I, I talked to him a little bit because I, I was like, I've never been out there. I wanted to do a mule deer hunt. And, and he's done a lot of it, and uh, he said he hunts, you know, a lot higher elevation, of course. And yep. uh, we didn't really get into the differences and stuff, but he uh, he said when he gets time, he drives up from southern New Hampshire up there in the National Forest, and he likes to hunt up there, so uh, kudos to him. Well, it's a badass forest, you know? Like, the yeah, the elevation is, you know, it's lower, but... Um, you, know, you can get into those steep, those steep mountains, and uh, it can be just as hard, to, you know. Oh, absolutely. To climb them as uh, as some of those western mountains. Yeah, it's and it's access too. You know, there's some big tracts of land that um, is just not a lot of road access. You gotta you gotta do some hiking. Yeah. You gotta be on your feet. Um, there's not as much logging as there used to be in the national forest. They used to be a lot more, and they, they build roads, and then there's fresher cuts and stuff. Uh, you still see some of it, but not like it was back in the 90s, 80s and 90s. And um, But it's uh, definitely some vast land to, to tap into in yep. places. Yeah, there's a guy that writes uh, writes to me from Idaho to my um, Hunt Suburbia email, and he um, I think it was after I did the podcast with Pat Burns who shot that really nice Massachusetts buck this year that, you know, could be 11 and a half, 12 and a half years old. It's old. He's been following it for five, six years. Yeah. Um, and he saw the video that I did about it and he wrote in and he's like, you know, I killed a buck like that in Idaho one time and it was, uh, I think it was 12 and a half years old and it was just one of those freaks that had still had good antlers at 12 and a half and he wow. showed me pictures of it and he yeah. also ended up killing one of the oldest bull elk um, ever shot in Idaho as well. I forget how old that was. Wow. Um, so he shares some cool stories, and he's, yeah. he, he gets way up and way into the backcountry up there and, and loves it. Shot shot a nice buck this year, sent me a picture. But, yeah, it made me want to look into going to Idaho sometime. Yeah. You know, I, I do got to do some more traveling around the, yeah. around the country. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those, those old, old deer, I don't think you see them so much up our way. Um, you know, you've the winter severity. Yeah. We've had some mild winters the last couple of years. Let's face it; that's why we've we've got good hunting now. But when we have harsh winters, 
and coyotes. Yep. Um, it definitely takes a toll of them. Um, there's a lot of predators out there for fawns now. We've got bears and bobcats and coyotes, so it's a tough life for the Mountain deer. lions? Of all the miles you put on, what do you think? Um, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of... I think it's. I thought it was funny that the one got hit in Connecticut on the interstate. Yeah. Came from where? Well, South Dakota. South Dakota. Yeah. They say there's no breeding populations. Are there some that pass through? I don't know. Maybe there yeah. is. Maybe there isn't. I don't know about the breeding populations, but there are that pass through. So the same guy, and I, I keep saying this, and he hasn't said anything about it yet. But Pat Burns is my friend. I hope he doesn't mind me bringing this up. But he got a picture of a mountain lion um, at the same area where he shot that big buck. Really? Uh, four or five years ago, he uh, had the picture of it. He was in there. He said he was in there scouting preseason, and he heard this sound he'd never heard before, and it just made the hair in the back of his neck stand up, and it was up on the ridge above him and never saw it, but it was just a this sound he had never heard. And he, he went up there, put a camera up, a week later went and checked it, and there was one picture of a mountain that's unmistakably a mountain lion. You know, you get a lot of people that post a fuzzy picture or something, yeah. right? And it could be a lynx or a bobcat. Right. Or... This is a mountain lion, 100%. And um, I'll see if I can get show you that picture sometime. And then he's got pictures of, um, he found all his footprints. And he's he put you know his pistol next to it. And it's a, definitely a mountain lion footprint. So okay. whether it was just traveling through. Massachusetts, which I I think he never saw it again and never got another picture of it. Yeah, um, it definitely was here. So yeah. you know they, they they do make their way up. I, I'm still amazed. But they need to find another one to You're right. you know have a population. Right. So. But I mean the one that was hit in Connecticut coming from South Dakota that just blows my mind. Yep. So well, uh, I thought it was kind of I was just traveling on nine, 90 West a uh, um, couple days ago and. I got to the point where it says this is the highest peak um, on I-90 West, um, east of South Dakota. So 90 comes all the way from South Dakota. And I just started thinking, you know, there's there's got to be patches of, you know, patches of woods the whole way. The way the Appalachian Trail makes its way from, mm. you know, Georgia yeah. all the way up to Maine. Yeah. Something could something could make its way along that. So they, they, they'll find their way. I would think there would be more pictures with as many cameras as, as out there, let's face it. But, uh, like I said, if they are here, there isn't many. No, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, the other thing I want to talk about when you're, you know, still hunting. So, what's your strategy on, on how do you still hunt? I've, uh, I listened to a couple podcasts. I mean, I still hunt too. Everybody kind of still hunts from time to time. And I think in the basic sense, you're just making your way through the woods quietly, stopping when you get to a spot for every five, five, ten minutes here and there, right? Well, I used to cover a lot more ground than I do now. I go f- cover a lot of ground, go fast, yep. until I'm into the sign or something. And I still do that to a point, but I've slowed down a lot. Uh, I used to bump a lot more deer. Um you but, don't want to bump deer when you're still hunting, really, right? You want to... No, it's you're... It's not like track... Unless you've got some snow, and then you can follow it. Right, yeah. right. But, you know, just covering uh, a lot of ground and weeding through the, the ground that you don't want to spend time in. Uh, you know, the 90-10 rule, that's <clears throat> that's in play. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when the rut's going on, and... Um, you know, you got does around and feeding, you know, anything can happen. Uh, so in that situation, you want to slow right down. It's like when I shot that, uh, I got to all that sign, and lucky for me that I did stop uh, for a minute and slow down because I very easily could have walked up that rub line and, and uh, bumped him before I got a look at him. Um, but if you... If you cover enough ground and go through enough woods, you'll find those spots where you you're like, okay, now I've really got to slow down and pay attention here, and uh, and uh, that's what happened that day. So, 
What are the scrapes come into play at all? You mentioned rub line. How do you how do you look at scrapes in the big woods? Um, rub and scrape lines. Uh, it's it's good to know where they are. Uh, you know that told you that buck went through there. But you know, in some of that big woods, they may lay down those scrapes and not yeah. come back. Just feeling frisky one day, and or or get on a doe yeah. and they're yeah. two or three miles away. Um, but once in a while, you'll see those big old primary scrapes that you remember where they were. And um, that's, it's just, they travel through those areas. So if you've got all this land out there and you know that they go through there quite often, so the, you've just narrowed uh, down the big woods and you've just increased your chances a lot. So by covering all that ground and knowing where all those spots are, you've weeded through so much of that woods out there. Um, so that's that's a big part of the way I hunt. Yeah. And going back to the scouting, so the three days you went scouting, you know, before the season started there, are yeah. you, you must just be looking for rubs and scrapes, right? <laughs> Seeing where the, the fresh sign yeah, is. Yeah, and, and where the feed is and where the, some, maybe some does are hanging out. Yeah. And Seeing if, if the acorns are, are there. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of these spots... Uh, have smokes others don't uh i got one area i really like to hunt there's, there's no oak for there might be a little bit but there's not much for a, f- a few miles but there's some beach and if it's a good beach here that's something i usually check out i ended up going up there and i wasn't finding much usually you can tell the the good beach years from where the bears are and the bears feeding too, but uh, I wasn't finding it in that spot this year, so that's why I I jumped across the valley to another mountain where I knew there was some acorns and uh, started hunting on that side. So, you know, and then you, you get those freak years where there's no mass crops and then you've got to be on to the brows and the natural food and the lichens and the mushrooms and the ferns and so are those in the lower elevate like in those types of years what what brows are you looking for in, in big woods new hampshire um you know those cut off areas Cuts, that, yeah. yeah that come back with that soft maple shoots and stuff and raspberry bushes and um you know there's enough cutting going on uh, I'm definitely on a lot of the private land around that you can you can find that even in the in the national forest some um, if you do your homework um, a lot of those cuts up there there's a lot older but there there is enough fresh cutting around if you uh, can key into that um, yeah, I'd imagine there if you got a nice cut they're in there even in the mast mast crop years they're probably yeah. still hanging around in there they, yeah. they like eating that stuff definitely yeah um with still hunting um i've uh i, I listened to a, a podcast i think it was big buck registry deer hunt podcast and um they were interviewing the salernos out of the adirondacks i don't know if you've heard of those guys yeah. but they're a really good hunting family and dedicated to hunting and they still hunt a lot and what their strategy was that they were relaying on this podcast is get up as high as you can early in the morning top of the mountains you know you gotta get up early to do that and sit for the first half hour to 45 minutes you know of of shooting light sit high Mm -hmm. you might catch one coming up um to bed up high and then if they don't they all kind of work their way down the mountains you know they they kind of hunt as a team but do you do any uh um... i like i like to go to high points hike to the top of a mountain hunt your way down it's much easier to hunt down on them than hunt up definitely without a question you got the advantage you've got the advantage um you know when you're still hunting you can you can use the wind to your favor tracking you you you're just you're committed regardless yep um but yeah, definitely, definitely getting up high. Uh, I like transition zones. I like where the hardwood meets the softwood. A lot of a lot of things seem to happen there, uh, especially with a lot of contour changes. Yeah, if you if you see those spots and there's usually some runs around there, some deer sign. Yeah, and that's something you can use Google Earth too to Absol- to find out, right? Yep, absolutely. Yep. 
Absolutely. Maybe that's what the uh, the Idaho guy did. He was like, "Oh, there's probably there's some elevation changes, and there's a, a yeah. nice edge here." Yeah, I, I was surprised. That's why I asked him. I said, "How the heck did you pick this spot?" And he he picked a good spot, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he knows what he's doing. Yep. Um. So what else goes into your still hunting? Um. Have you ever still hunted up to a bedded, a bedded? buck yeah oh, yeah 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 killed one that way yeah 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 i d- actually i i did with a bow uh years ago in pennsylvania on the ground uh but yeah really yeah. that's yeah that's great yeah and i was always thinking that would be really cool if somebody tracked a, a you know track a tracker who yeah. specializes with a bow yeah and getting that on camera my god that would be amazing yeah yeah, yeah i remember i was i was still hunting and it was a rainy day in pennsylvania and uh, I did a lot of walking with the bow, and uh, I saw this small buck bed, and it took me about an hour to close that 70 or 80 yards to get the shot, but I ended up getting them. I was so proud of myself. It was a little buck. Yeah, but that's awesome. Um, Yeah. But, see, that goes back to the whole learning curve, going to a place where there was a lot of deer, where you would experiment, try things. Um rattling and calling and stuff yeah you know i did did some of that and then i'm like it really does work so i'm gonna go back to new hampshire and try this and uh i've taken quite a few deer with a grunt tube and rattling yeah so um so while you're still hunting uh yeah 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 i'm sure a bunch of ways but a bunch of ways how have you utilized um rattling and and calling um while still hunting? well if it's if it's one of those days that's um maybe really noisy too yeah um find a spot that uh that you're gonna hang out for a while try some rattling um i i killed a buck i don't know maybe 10 years ago didn't have a lot of time in the afternoon. It was real crunchy out. And I, I went up into this piece, only had about an hour and a half. And I said, I got up to this first rise and it's, it was just noisy every step you take. And I, I sat down and I, I rattled. And I, I said, I'm gonna wait here about 15 minutes and try it again. And I started the second sequence and I heard something and turned and he, he came in the opposite way he should have come. Yeah, he didn't, yeah, yeah. He, he, he startled me. I still had the antlers in my hand, and I actually had to, like, drop him, reach for my gun as he's taken off. I was lucky I pulled up. I got him. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. He, was, uh, he was 200 even, nine-pointer. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Um, I think that was in, like, oh, 2004. Yeah. Um, but in those conditions... Uh, he had bark all over his antlers and stuff. He he had heard that maybe. I don't know how far away he was, but uh, I wasn't sneaking up on him that afternoon, so yeah. it worked out. Yeah. Jeff Doyle, do you know who he is? Yeah. 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 Great guy. He's been on the podcast. And he got bucked that, that way this year. It was a super crunchy day, but, like, no wind. So, yeah, yeah what what can you do? Yeah. You know, I, I watched his YouTube video. I yeah. like that. Yeah, he's yeah. got some good video. Yeah. Got right down in a... Um, into a saddle between two high peaks on a super loud, crunchy day, but with no wind, or yep. you know those rattles, you rattle it, it carries. It probably carried to both those peaks, and if anything's up on it, you might catch the curiosity. Yeah, yeah, yep. definitely, definitely. Yep. And then, uh, so tracking, you do tracking too, right? When there's yep. snow, you like to track. Yeah, I do. I do like to track. Um, you have any pro- problems picking up a big buck track up in New Hampshire? Um, not seeing as many big buck tracks as maybe we used to. Yeah. Uh, definitely can get on a buck track, but the big thing is the conditions, and if we have snow, they get it a lot more often in northern New Hampshire. We're right in the base of the White Mountains, so sometimes you've got to go up in elevation to get the snow. So I may leave my house. We don't have anything, but if you get up, you know, eighteen hundred feet or something like that, you may have it. Yeah. Um, so knowing those spots where the rub and scrape lines are. Yeah. Or and knowing where those does were hanging out. Yeah. Where they were feeding. That's when you can go find a track. 
I love uh, those saddles, those high saddles that they seem to, to go through between the peaks. If you remember all those, those are good places to pick up a track. Yeah. Um, so it all it all plays into it. Yeah. And you pro not being a camera trail camera guy, are you probably not an Onyx or GPS on your phone kind of guy? No, or are you? no. no I, I still carry an old style GPS. And the, the big reason for years is if I find something I really like and I want to mark it, a lot of times it's not that I don't remember. It's if I come in a different way or how close I am to that point. Um, no, I'm not, uh, I'm not big. I don't have that on my phone. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not an Onyx guy. <laughs> I probably should be. Cause well, it it's does re- make it easy. And it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Pretty easy. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, there's a spot that I found a few years ago and it was just a natural game run. It just seemed like the moose and the deer and stuff went in, there was two steep ledges and there's some thick softwood, and it, it's just a little, it bottlenecks up, and uh, it's just, game goes through there all the time, and I'm thinking to myself, boy, if, if I was a stand hunter, yeah, this would this would be the spot. I was just going to say, I want, you know. You know, but it's it's a, it's a long ways to get up there. You're in the rut, yeah. Yeah, um, but I, I thought about bringing a stand up there and, and hanging it and just leaving it. Cause, yeah. And uh, if I'm ever in that that area, maybe hang out and and sit when the timing's right. Yeah. But like I said, I'm not much of a sitter anymore. But um, it's definitely an effective way. Yeah. During the rut. Yeah. The guys with a lot of patience in those spots um, can kill a lot of deer that way. If you sit there for a week during the rut in one yep. of those for sure pinch points. Yeah. Yeah. I had a friend uh, years ago that would do that. He would just sit dark to dark up in these remote spots, and um, he killed some really big bucks. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he put the hours in, and he always said would to me, "Would he set up a base camp somewhere?" No, no just... he would hike in, and and but he always told me it didn't bother me if I didn't see anything, and I was like, "What do you mean?" And he said, "I keep going back." If I didn't see something, I figured my odds were going up all the yeah, time. Yeah. You know, sooner or later it was going to happen, and yeah. it usually did. Yeah. He may get something the first week, or sometimes it would be the third or fourth week of the season. Uh, but that guy had patience. He would just hit the same spot? Yeah. yeah. Well, he had a few few spots he'd yeah. go to, but he would just... But if, he, if like, he was there for a week, he must be like, all right, it's coming tomorrow with that gambler's yeah. fallacy yeah. mentality, you know? Or... Yeah. That should, I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> I just can't do it. Um, yeah. no. my, my dad used to tell me there were guys, uh, I forget who, but in the big woods of Vermont, um, near where I grew up, that would go up and sit in a sleeping bag, you know, and just yeah. be bundled up there. And yeah. then, you know go to their little base camp that's not too far away, sleep in the sleeping bag there and bring it back and yep. just kind of like living in that sleeping bag waiting for a, yep. a yeah, the, to come by. These two guys that did that that I'm talking about, there was two guys that that uh, would sit like that. They would they would build like a, a boxed-in uh, blind in front of them and bring a blanket and light a can of Sterno underneath them to stay yeah. warm. Yeah. So they'd do that, yeah. you know, when it was real cold. Um, but boy, took a lot of patience. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll say. So, uh, shed hunting is, um, it's a big passion of yours, right? Almost yep. as much as, uh, hunting, yeah. you say? I, I just... look at some of those fat ones. <laughs> those yeah. Are, those are nuts. Yeah. Yeah, that buck, that buck there, um, this actually, uh, we've got three years worth off him, uh, that's not the same one? No. Yeah. No. Look at those bases. Yeah. But that, that buck there, um, he was a ghost. Um, I had a friend who um, was a big shed hunter. He passed away years ago. He was a, an older fellow, but he was a pioneer of shed hunting in our area. Yeah. And uh, him and I, I found that set, and he found another set. That's cool and then they uh, angle down, these ones here. I found another side. So I think we've got five antlers off that buck. And as far as I know, that we know of, nobody ever took that deer. Yep. Um, but he would... Uh, could have died of old age up there. Could have. Yep. Could have. Um, 
Yeah, there's uh, shed hunting to me is uh, is just more time in the woods. It's it's like uh, I enjoy the whole process. So whatever I can learn of what's out there for bucks. Yeah. Who made the season? These are heavy. And uh, you know, if you're looking for new areas all the time, um, it's just another another tool that. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, like I said, I think I enjoy that as much as hunting. It's the catch and release part of hunting. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So what do you do with all of you got them? Where do you got them? Somewhere in your house and in a yeah. room with the, the, they stack to the ceiling in there with a thousand yeah. of them or what? Well, um, they're here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> um, my wife thinks it's crazy, yeah. of course, yeah. uh, but she's been with me a long time. She knows it's what I like to do. Um, we did sell a bunch, a bunch of moose antlers when we were building our house years ago. Yep. Needed the money, but um, the last few years I've just been hoarding them. So. Yeah. yeah, especially the deer antlers. It takes a lot of effort and to find a real nice set, and uh, it's nice to know the history. I think I have killed two bucks that I have sheds off. I was gonna say how many? Yeah, uh... two, two that they were both uh, the deer. Uh, I killed this year. I think I got one off him. I know I've got one off him from two years ago. Yeah. And I killed one years ago. I had a shed off. But I found a bunch of sheds that have been taken by other people. Um, this real nice shed. Uh, my dog found one time. And uh, one of my friend's sons shot the, the buck the next year. Not too far from where I found it. And... Uh, when I found out he shot it, I drove up there to see it, and uh, I gave him the shed, handed it to him, and uh, he still got it. But it's nice knowing the history of some of that. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I think it's harder to get, like you said, if you only got you know two deer that you've killed, you have their sheds. Um, yeah. It's harder to do that in the big woods. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. It's... Yeah. it's There's just so much, and it depends year to year where they're going to shed, and... You know, the mass crops, the snowfall. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of factors. Then if if there's people feeding them out there, that changes things, obviously, oh, too. Oh, people do that up there? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's still quite a few people that feed, but definitely up northern New Hampshire. But, yeah, in our area, there's people that feed them, do too. Do people have those fences where you, you know, I think it's illegal. I don't know if it is in every state, but, um, you know, the shed trap, they call it, you yeah. know. Yeah. I hope not. Hopefully they're not doing that. Anytime I see that or somebody puts something online, I kind of discourage that. and For sure. Try not to sound like a jerk, but they shouldn't be doing yeah, it. Yeah, you don't want to rip, rip one out that's not ready to no, no. fall off, you know? No. Go out and put some miles in, do some homework. and. So you just end up going back to the same spots that you, you hunt and look around um, there? and or Well, some spots I've been going since I was a kid, and I'm always looking for new spots. And like I said, it changes year to year depending on what's going on. But uh, What changes about it? Is it the, well, the food source? Yeah, food source. Yeah. Food source and the type of winter we're having. Like right now, I mean, even up our way, it's so mild. Yeah. They're still traveling that you can go on the back roads and see deer traveling everywhere. Yeah. You're not going to find, you know, pass and migration trails right now. I mean, we've only got maybe six inches of snow up where I'm working right now. But there's, there's deer just wandering everywhere and feeding. And, um, you know, but the years that we get the snow early and and it, it kind of socks them in and, and we don't have the mass crops, or it kind of puts them into those traditional deer yard areas and stuff. Um, so you go check those for sheds? Yeah, sometimes, you know, but I, I tell you, depending, lots of times they've lost them by the time they get to those spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, the, you look online now, there's, there's some guys starting to pick some up. They're dropping here and there. Um, and then I, I know a fellow that saw a nice buck yesterday was still carrying on. Uh, it was a big buck. Uh, he actually called me and told me about it on the way down here. Yeah. And I'm like, where did you see that? <laughs> uh, I filed it. Yeah. He's yeah. a forgotten brook. Yeah. 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 There's a few of those spots. 
He is not a hunter, the guy that called you? Oh, he's a hunter. He's a hunter, but he knows that I've... You got to share info. Yeah, yeah. he knows I love to shed hunt. And uh, he said, yeah, uh, you know the spot. And he described it. And I'm like, yeah. So uh, I'm going to go check that out. Yeah. Well, probably most of the time up there, while you're when you're shed hunting, there's snow on the ground, right? Um, yeah, I do. I do a lot in the springtime, and the reason being is I'm really busy with work right now. Yep. I took the time off to go hunting. I'm really working hard uh, right now. But when I shut down from logging, mud season when the roads get posted, we do a little maintenance and we do some firewood. But other than that, I've got quite a bit of time again. So we go hard for three months, and then I got a vacation again. Yeah. yeah. So um, me and the dogs, I take my dogs. Uh, I got three labs. Um, and then they're, they're not super shed dogs by any means, uh, but I enjoy the company. Yeah. My dog Tracker is pretty good with the moose sheds. Uh, my, my dog Timber can, can find sheds too, but it, it's more about just hiking around, looking for sign, uh, extending the deer season a little bit extending you know. the deer season but you know once in a while you'll stumble on a buck and you're like wow i gotta do some more homework here and we need to hunt here <laughs> and, like any of these yeah 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 and it's nice because i got some buddies that are into it too and we share information and and uh it's it's do I'll you tell. score your sheds uh, I have somebody else do them, but okay. yeah. What yeah. did this one score? I'm curious with all that mass. I think that those, if I remember right, one side is like 62 and change, and the other one is like 64 inches. But uh, it's crazy mass 62 measurement. 62 and 64, so 126 plus, that's, that's got to be much more than... Oh, yeah. plus the eighteen inch, yeah. Yeah, so you know he's he's a one he's a one forty steer, but it doesn't do it justice. No, it doesn't. At that's all. a that's a that's, that's a smashing one forty. That's insane, yeah. Well, compare that to the buck I shot this year. That that's true. That's face, one forty as well. Yeah. You know. Yep. It looks spindly compared to that. Oh yeah. Um, but you know, there's there's still some big bucks out there. I'm always looking to find out where there's more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> From the looks, there's some really big ones down here in your country. There's some, yeah. There's there's some nice deer around in Matt. I mean, all around Massachusetts and suburban areas, where hunting access is tough. Yep. Because a lot of it you just can't hunt, or it has to be private land, and just the amount of anti hunters is just really tough. Yeah. Um, but that allows bucks to get big and old, and if you can find the right places to yeah, to get in and do it. Um, then yeah, it's pretty fun. It's just different. It's a whole different yeah. world. Yeah, we're we're pretty lucky. We just got so much land up our way. You're yep. seeing more posted land, of course, but there's still the big tracks of paper company land yep. and private land, and it's you know um, there's plenty of room for people to get out there. Um, we're just really lucky. Like I said, you know, you got a million acres in the White Mountain National yeah. Forest. You know, you're going through Grafton Co-ops and Carroll County's right in the, the edge of Maine, so that's quite a span. Yeah, one of my uh, one of my friends recently built a camp up in uh, northern New Hampshire, you know, Pittsburgh area. You know, just just yeah. say that, and um, you know, I really I'm thinking about it. You know, my my wife and I want to buy something somewhere, and the the dream is like on a lake near some mountains yeah so you can do fun stuff on a lake or leave it at least have a lake nearby some good fishing nearby yeah maybe some skiing nearby yeah and hunting you know like i'm, I'm definitely looking uh northern new hampshire i think it would be a great place to yeah. have a camp yeah yeah i'm lucky i i've got a friend um that's got a camp in maine but it's just out of new hampshire so i'm lucky enough to go over there and hunt out of his camp yeah oh yeah let's talk about your you got a maine buck this year yeah yeah what was that one like yeah well so that hunt yeah we went up to we went up to maine uh lost my dad um three days after killing that new hampshire buck sorry and uh and there's a lot of that happening yeah yeah, yeah. I just interviewed Chris Reedy and uh, both of those guys. Well, one of the guys there lost his dad this year, and, yeah. then, and then hunted and had a story about that. And yeah. I lost my mom this year. And yeah, yeah. 
It's yeah, tough. It, it is. It is. You know, you're never really ready for it. But um, after I got that deer and, and dad passed away, I, I, I was like, well, am I going to go to Maine? And then I said, yeah, I'm going to go to Maine. So we actually, uh, his funeral was on a Sunday. And I left for deer camp at 3 o'clock in the morning, Monday morning. And uh, I drove up there, and uh, I'm glad I did. Um, it was one of those things. I, I got out of the car, and I saw a deer. I jumped a doe within first five minutes of being in the woods. And, uh, it felt right. It felt right. Yeah. Seemed like we were in the deer right from the get-go, which is, which is hard to do sometimes. Um, that's a really vast area where I was hunting in the Western Mountains there. And uh, my friend, uh, there's a group of guys that go up every year, and uh, I've been going for three years now, so I'm, I'm getting to know the lay of the land up there, but it's, it's uh, these guys know it much better than me. And um, my friend John had scouted an area, and uh, we actually went up there the day before I got my buck, and... Uh, I went down into this cut, and I, I was going to go in the bottom of this cut and just make a big swing. And I got about halfway through the cut, and a doe jumped up and took off. And I watched her, and she only went out about 50, 60 yards, and she just, she just hung up. So I, I just waited and waited and waited, and I'm scanning and looking and scanning. And she started to finally go away. I got a glimpse of another deer. And I pulled up. I, I thought I saw her antlers. I pulled up, and it was a small, I don't know, it was a four or six pointer. It was a small buck, and I wasn't going to shoot him anyways after I'd already shot a buck. And and I was like, okay. Um, so we ended up seeing like five deer there that day. And the next day, um, I went and checked a piece first thing in the morning. There wasn't much of a sign in that. And uh, I told my friend, I, I sent him a message, said, I'm going to go back up where we were yesterday. Um, so I parked about a half mile, two-thirds of a mile away, and it was cold. Wind was blowing and stuff. So I said, okay, I'm going to use the window in my advantage, and I'm going to make some swings around some big cuts up here. And there was snow, but it wasn't really enough for track and snow everywhere. If you got in the softwood, it just disappeared. And... So I went up around this big clear cut and and uh, seeing some occasional sign and and I got in between these two cuts and there was a lot of deer tracks going back and forth and I was I looked at my GPS at one point and I was only about I think five or six tenths from where I'd seen the deer the day before and I said I'm just going to mill down through here and and head that way and there's a logging road in between two clear cuts. It's almost like a, a little strip that they left with spruce and fir and it had some blowdowns. And I, I made my way up over one of these blowdowns and I'm looking down through the cut and I could see a rack sticking out. The sun was out and the first thing I saw was antlers. <laughs> yeah. And I said, that's a buck and he's coming right at me. Same as the buck I got in New Hampshire. He's coming right directly at me. And he's, when I first saw him, I think he was I'm going to guess 130, 40 yards away. And I said, I'm going to let him keep coming. And uh, he got to that point, I don't know, about 100 yards, and he turned. And that edge of that cut was all these little spruce and fir Christmas trees right there. And I said, if he goes in that, he's going to disappear. So I took the shot there. It was, you know, 100 yards offhand, ended up dropping him right there. Yeah, nice. So I run down there and... Uh, I lost sight of him in the scope. I said I didn't didn't see him go. I jacked another one in the, the pump carbine and closed the distance really quick. And and I'm getting down through there, and it's got kind of that witch grass that's tall in that area right there. And I I don't see him. I don't see him. And then I just about stepped on him. He was right there. He was done. Um, ended up one one and done. Yeah. Well, I think that's awesome. How many days after your dad passed away? <sighs> It was, it was probably about ten days. Yeah, and uh, yeah, he would have wanted you up there hunting and absolutely experiencing that, you know. Absolutely, you know. I was I was so tickled that it's like okay, the car's like 
I don't know, three quarters of a mile away, but I got the jet sled in the car. And you know how they tow in a jet sled with a little bit of snow. Yeah. I'm going back to the car first. And uh, I got the car as close as I could on that road and uh, grabbed the sled and went up and got him uh, out myself. And God, I was telling my buddy back at camp that night, I was like, I never stopped. I went right to the car without stopping. I was wound up and, yeah. uh, and uh, loaded him in. Uh, I said, geez, I don't know. He's a nice deer. He's 185, 190 pounds. It's a nice buck. And uh, got him back to camp. And uh, uh, my friend Brian, his son, Ethan, had shot a buck. I said, well, let's put him in the truck together and go check him in. And, and we went down and uh, checked him in. Truth be known, it ended up that one was uh, 202.7. So. No, wow. So two, yeah, two 200-pounders Two 200-pounders, yeah. yeah. Is that yeah. your first year doing that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow, great. Yeah. So that was a it was a good thing. It was yeah. a milestone, huh? Yeah. 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 Well, you're, you're, uh, you're into them. Yeah, well, you're, hopefully you're next right year, at, you're too. Right into <laughs> <laughs> next year, uh, so is your, your daughter going off to college? And... That's the plan. She yeah. applied uh, two weeks ago. She applied to six schools. Yeah. We heard back from one within like three days she got accepted. Uh, so we'll see. We don't yeah. know where she's going yet. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Well, be... You might have some more time next year, right? Less money, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we've been down this road before. College is expensive, but uh, I'm going to make time regardless. Um, yep, definitely. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, when I, I was, um, I'm still going to do this, but there, I was writing this long article just about the history of good deer hunters up in the Northeast, right? Mm-hmm. And um, that was, a, I've got a creative mind. I've got a do something creative all the time. I got to make something. And that was going to be my big project. And that was before I came up with the hunt stock uh, idea. And I want to do this huge hunt stock yeah. event. That's going to be in August. Now, if you want to come down, I you know, would love to have you have a couple tickets to give you before you go. Definitely. I know you don't like coming down below that. Yeah. yeah. Mason Dixon, I, Massachusetts, New Hampshire. Line, I can make but... an exception for <laughs> hunting stuff. Yeah. Um, but you were mentioning, you said, uh, Charlie foot. He's got to be on that list, and I'd never heard of him. And yeah. you know, like, can you tell me a little bit about Charlie Foot? Yeah, Charlie is Charlie's the man up mm-hmm. our area. He's uh, he's a go getter. Uh, he is one of the original members that started the Trophy Club uh, in New Hampshire. He's a scorer, and he is a big buck slayer. Yeah, putting it mildly. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how old Charlie is, uh, mid-70s. Um, he's still getting a buck every year. Uh, I know he shot... But you'll never see it on social media or anything, no, right? He's, he doesn't he, have a phone. No, and, yeah. no, he's just one of those guys. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's got a landline at his house, and uh, you're not going to see it on social media. But that guy, he's a hunter. He's a really good tracker. He's a still hunter. He'll sit... He'll do whatever the conditions dictate. So up our way, that's kind of how you have to be, to be versatile. Um, but he has gotten them every, every way, you know, tracking, sitting. Um, but he's, last I knew, he had 12 or, 12 or 13 entries in our New Hampshire record book. Uh, I don't know how many 200-pound bucks he's got, but there's a lot. Yeah. And I think... Yeah. It was a few years ago he shot the biggest deer in the state one year. Hmm. Weight-wise? Yeah, weight-wise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it dressed 249 that yeah. year. Huh. Um, he can get it done. Yeah. And what does it take to get into the record book up there? Uh, a typical uh, needs to score 120. Yeah. Um, non-typical, uh, I think it's in the 130s. Um, but uh, don't quote me on that. Yeah. Put me on the spot. <laughs> it's changed a couple times. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's a, a pretty respectable deer in New oh, Hampshire. Oh, yeah. You know? Yep. Um, somebody that can go out and get one of those, you know, it's, it's not just giving recognition to the hunter. It's the animal itself, you know? Um, you're like the rest of us. You just want to see those big bucks yeah. and, and, and uh, tell other people about it. And, uh 
Yeah. Um, that's one thing about the club. We get to see a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the other thing. There, there is big deer shot all over the state. You know, there's not just one particular spot. For uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I was amazed by the bucks taken in southern New Hampshire sometimes. Just... Did Absolutely. you ever see that buck Neil Pendleton took yeah. Southern New Hampshire? That crazy yeah. 190 something inch. Yeah, I mean, yeah. those are just—it's crazy that they've adapted and learned and and grew that big to to evade people. Yeah, uh, you know, living a lot closer to a lot of people. Yeah, well, some of them will find safety and a safety right. net living close to people because they know that it, it's either you can't hunt there or it's overlooked or right you know right yeah yeah i just um i'm more of a wanderer yeah. uh, i would get bored just hunting in too small a piece just yeah. because um i'm not a sitter yeah like i said sitting's effective it's just maybe the warm weather i can still do some sitting but uh i i went one year to saskatchewan with my bow and I sat in that stand and froze my butt <laughs> off for 50 some odd hours. Yeah. And I ended up getting a 10 pointer on the last day. But uh, still, it probably wasn't the most fun you had getting It a wasn't 10-pointer. the most fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in an open tree stand, you know, not in a blind up in that tree. And, and I'm like, you know, the guys that can do that, yeah. I, I give them credit yeah. because I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to really, I'd like to become a um, diverse, just a diverse hunter, you know, yep. living in the suburbs, I've got to hunt close to home, take the time when you can to, to go hunting. Right. I wish I, you know, had big woods where um, I could go get lost and because I would probably do that every day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd love to figure out these suburban bucks, um, get the ideal scenario is shoot a couple of them early and then in November when there's snow chase some snow a little bit yep go to new hampshire go to maine or vermont absolutely absolutely that's what's nice you know we've here in the northeast we've got options in just a couple hours drive think about it yeah you know you live in a big western state you can't jump over the border in 45 minutes or an hour a lot of them you gotta you know get a draw to get tags and stuff too to even do that so so I, I can be in Maine in an hour from my house. I can be in Vermont in an hour from yeah. my house. Yeah. So, um, but you're probably going to Maine. <laughs> I'm probably going to Maine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I hunted Vermont uh, one year about 30 years ago, and I didn't know the area. And a friend brought me over, and it was every turn I bumped into somebody, and it's like I just I'm not doing this. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of hunters in Vermont, and it's, you know, there's some big woods too, but it's just smaller compared to Maine and northern yeah. northern New Hampshire. You know? Yeah, definitely. I noticed uh, in the area I hunt, there was a lot of Vermont hunters this year at the end of the season, and uh, a friend of mine brought up the point I didn't realize they have the one buck rule, right? Yeah, now there's a one buck rule in Vermont. Yep. Just a couple years old, or maybe just one year old. Yeah. yeah. So I think that might, you know, probably some of them got their deer and then jumped sure. over. Yep, that makes sense. Um, you know, some of those areas are only 15, 20 minutes from Vermont. So um, definitely, definitely saw a lot of green plates, a lot of good hunters in Vermont. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like skiing and snowboarding. If you're snow, like Vermont, a lot of good skier snowboarders come out of Vermont and New yeah. Hampshire, and where you you got to ski on these icy, tough condition, you know, mountains, and that's where you learn to do it. Yeah. Then you go out west. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and you're a better skier snowboarder. Yeah. I think the same thing applies with hunting. Don't you get a kick out of that ten worst states to deer hunt in? Yeah. That we look at that yeah. list that was online. It's oh like, yeah. Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont are in the top ten. Oh, of course, they're all they're doing is looking at the trophy, you know, the trophies, you know, right. the number of Boone and Crockett's that come out. That's yeah. what they're what they're basing it on, you know. Yeah. yeah, the value isn't the same for everybody. Somebody, yeah. you know, it's not just how many Boone and Crockett, Pope and Young bucks are coming out of a county. It's you know, right for you, it might be can I walk all yeah. day without running yeah. into posted land or somebody else, and yeah. that's yeah. Well, it's a good hunting state for you. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I shot a buck uh, two years ago. Um, 
I shot it with a late friend of mine's 1936 Marlin 32 Special. Um, it was an eight pointer, dressed 175 pounds, but that means as much to me as some yeah. of the bigger bucks that I've oh, shot. Yeah. Um, and an eight pointer, 175 is a big buck. You know, I put that old 32 Special uh, in the truck and I deliberately took my Remington pump carbine out, yeah. so I had to use it, yeah. you know? That's what I grew up hunting with was a 32 Special. Um, those lever action guns are yes. just fun. Yep, they're yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just, after I got that buck and I was thinking to myself, I, old Stanley would be proud of me because uh, <laughs> uh, his dad bought that gun brand new in 1937. So uh, I got it after he passed away. So um, oh, that's what you shot that buck with? Yeah. yeah, sorry, I missed that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. And Stanley was, Stanley Bachelor was his name. And he was shed hunting. I mean, I've been shed hunting for quite a while before it was a rave. I've been doing it for 35 years. Stanley was shed hunting in our area in the 50s and the 60s and stuff. <laughs> he was he was uh, he was quite a guy. Huh. Hunting, trapping, fishing. Uh, you know, just an avid outdoorsman. You know, yeah. Kind of a mentor type. Learned a lot. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Do you have uh, any uh, any kind of last parting words you'd want to, any more wisdom you want to bestow on folks? Uh, I would say, uh, I would say just uh, set a goal and stay after it. Yeah. And don't, don't talk yourself out of stuff. Um, you know, don't be, don't be that guy that says it's too hot. I'm not going to see anything. Because I've, I've done it before myself, uh, guilty of it. But don't let the conditions discourage you. And you're right. You can talk yourself out of it with cameras a lot, too. You yeah. can. Yeah. And especially, I know New Hampshire's got a, a cell cam law, um, what, 28 hours or 48 hours? Yeah. Yeah, after you get a picture. But some guys down in Mass, you know, won't hunt a spot if one of their cell cams haven't been triggering and sending them pictures. You know, right. they think there's no deer moving by yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so why go hunt it? But in reality, those cameras are only picking up probably 20% of what's moving through there. They could be right behind it. They could be out of range. Yeah. They could be yeah. using all kinds of trails right around yeah. your camera. Yeah. You know? No, I've just seen it up, up our way, too. I've seen people that have relied on it maybe too much. And it's bit them, you know, and um, it's it's a good tool for some people. But I'm just trying to to not not go that route, not use it if I don't have to. Yeah. Uh, I put a camera out once in a while, get some pictures, but uh, I'm not going to rely on it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just take it for what it is. Yeah. Cool. Well, hey, thanks so much for coming, man. That was a lot of fun. I appreciate uh, it. Yeah. I appreciate it. Here's a couple of tickets to uh, hunt stock here. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, and those stubs on the end are, uh, we're doing door prize drawings every day, $5,000 worth of different hunting stuff. Wow. So bows and maybe some muzzleloaders. I got to look into what the legality is for raffling off or handing out muzzleloaders. Right. But yeah, we're going to have some bows and stands and all, all kinds of deer hunting gear, clothing and yep. all that stuff uh, to be raffled off. So it'll yep. be a good time. Everything deer hunting is good, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And maybe if you want to do a, a seminar or a talk or something, if we've got some opening uh, opening spaces there on shed hunting or something or whatever, um, yeah, yeah sure. we'll be in touch about it. Absolutely. But cool. Thanks a lot for coming. Appreciate it. It was a pleasure.